just want to welcome everyone. We'll give it another minute or so to let everyone get in and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so as folks are trickling in, I want to go ahead and get us started um, and first welcome you uh, to the event this afternoon hosted by the New England HIV Implementation Science Network titled Looking for PrEP, Promoting MSM's HIV Prevention on Hookup Apps. My name is Kelly Scott. I'm an assistant professor at the Brown University School of Public Health, and I also serve as the liaison between Yale CIRA and the Providence Boston CIFAR. So in this role, I serve to organize and help facilitate events through the New England HIV Implementation Science Network. So if it's your first time joining for a network event, um, we're an initiative of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS at Yale University, or CIRA, which is part of the Yale School of Public Health. CIRA is an HIV research center funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And CIRA's partner in the network is the Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research, or the CIFAR. And this network was started in 2014 with an inaugural symposium and was created to really stimulate and support research and evaluation collaborations across New England, really with the goal of fostering partnerships among agencies, stakeholders, and researchers focused on implementation science in small urban areas with high prevalence of HIV. And so we have an exciting agenda today. Um, Dr. John Pachankis will serve as our moderator. Uh, Dr. Pachankis is the Susan Dwight Bliss Professor of Public Health and Psychiatry at Yale, as well as Director of Yale's LGBTQ Mental Health Initiative. His research examines the mental health of the LGBTQ populations in the U.S., as well as globally, and also the efficacy of the LGBTQ affirmative mental health interventions. He has published over 150 scientific papers on the LGBTQ mental health and stigma. And also recently co-edited the Handbook of Evidence-Based Mental Health Practice with Sexual and Gender Minorities, published in Oxford University Press. And so in addition to our moderator, we have an excellent group of speakers for you today. Um, and we'll be kicking things off with Jen Hecht, who's the co-founder and director of Building Healthy Online Communities. Uh, Jen has worked on, in sexual health and substance use for over 20 years. And as the co-founder and director of Building Healthy Online Communities, partners public health and dating apps to further HIV and STI prevention. She is also executive director at Springboard Health Lab, which is a new organization fostering bold ideas in public health to advance health equity. We will then hear from Dr. Catherine McCapagall. Dr. McCapagall is a research associate professor at Northwestern University. She holds a PhD in clinical psychology from Indiana University, where she trained at the renowned Kinsey Institute. Her research focuses on sexual health and HIV prevention among LGBT youth. And her most recent work has focused on PrEP knowledge, preferences, and messaging among LGBT adolescents, as well as LGBT adolescents' use of social media, sexual networking, and dating applications for partner seeking. And finally, we'll end with a presentation from the Chat for Change project, which is a collaborative project between a place to nourish your health, or APNH, CIRA, and the Connecticut Department of Health to connect 18, and 30, 18 to 34 year old MSM of color to their peers using social and sexual networking apps to encourage community prep uptake. We'll hear from Daniel Davidson uh, from Yale CIRA. He's the Assistant Director of CIRA's Community Research and Implementation Corps. And he's helped to lead Chat for Change, both in his previous role as the Connecticut Department of Public Health's first prep coordinator and while at CIRA. We'll hear from Ian Jackson from APNH, a place to nourish your health. Ian Jackson has been involved with APNH's Chat for Change project since 2020 and is now program facilitator for the project. Ian is a graduate of Quinnipiac University where he obtained a degree in media studies and a master's of business administration. 
And then finally, we'll hear from Claude Lewis, also from APNH. Claude is a graduate of Albright College and the University of Bridgeport, where he attained a master's degree in mental health counseling. He is a licensed professional counselor practicing in Connecticut and serves on Sierra's Community Advisory Board. Claude also works as a program facilitator for the C4C project. So very exciting group, um, but before I turn it over to our moderator, we wanted to start with a quick poll, just to get a sense of the audience in attendance for today. And so I'll go ahead and launch this. And so the question is, do you or your agency have experience with HIV prevention work using either dating or hookup apps? All right, and so it looks like we have 100% answered and we have a lot of yeses. So it seems like this is an area of interest and experience for the group today. Um, so really looking forward to hearing more from our speakers and from the audience. Um, so we'll have opportunities for questions both after each presentation and at the end of the talks today. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Pachangas to get us started. Yeah, well, um, thank you, Kelly, for that excellent um, overview and introduction. Our uh, first talk will be uh, by by Jen Hecht. Uh, Jen, do you want to take about uh, 20 minutes and then we'll open it up for, for questions right after your talk and do that um, with all of the, the speakers today? That sounds great. I'm going to go ahead and get my slides loaded. So bear with me while I do that. And if someone can let me know whether they're seeing the slides, that would be very helpful. Yep, they look good. Yes. All right, perfect, thanks so much. Um, so thank you um, to Daniel and, and John, Dr. Pachankis for inviting me to join you today. Um, I'm gonna just take a few moments to share a little bit about the work of building healthy online communities um, and you know, partnering with dating apps promote sexual health. So just for a little bit of context, um, Building Healthy Online Communities is a consortium of public health groups that are working in partnership with dating apps. Um, and this piece is really important. A number of years ago when we first started this work, around 2010, which was actually before apps and <laughs> during the time of websites, <laughs> of, of dating and hookup websites, um, we noticed that there were some folks in the public health sector that were really kind of looking at the websites and saying, um, you know, it's because of the websites that STIs are increasing or that HIV transmission is happening. And we really looked at it from a very different perspective, which was thinking about, you know, how this is also a way to reach people that we're trying to reach in our, within the public health sector. How can we work with these dating apps? Um, and so we really saw it as an opportunity. Um, and we did a bunch of formative research in which we gathered input from, again, website owners um, and managers, website users and public health um, leaders to really figure out what were some opportunities and then looking for um, areas of overlap. So that led to these three main goals. Um, so building healthy online communities came out of that project. Um, and you can see we're really focused on structural um, uh, sort of ongoing systems change. So we look at building self-sustaining features into apps that can promote um, sexual health, that can promote informed choices and that can reduce stigma. We have done some uh, quite a bit of work also in terms of thinking about how we coordinate and improve advertising and messaging on the apps. And really, again, our relationship with the apps. So we really wanna think about it as a collaborative relationship. Let's see, there we go. Um, so just wanna share some of our partners here. Um, these are some of our in public health partners. Um, you can see Yale, we've worked closely with uh, Dr. Pachankis um, on some projects. And what's important here is that we're really continuing to gather input from those public health partners and in collaboration with some of those public health partners from app users. So we've, we've worked quite cl closely with Emory on some of their um, regular ongoing surveys of MSM to gather data that has been very useful um, in terms of our communication and partnership with the apps. And then we're able to go to the apps and say, here's what we've heard your users want. So to, um, to give you an example here, um, in terms of how we continue to gather input and the sort of the importance of stakeholder input, this is from a project or a, a survey um, that was part of 
AMIS, which is the American Men's Internet Survey. That's an annual survey of MSM that Emory does. Um, and we added some questions to that survey and asked, um, you know, asked sort of amongst those, those survey participants, you know, what proportion use um, some of the dating apps to meet partners, which is a very high percentage, I think. At our most recent, it was in the range of 75%. And I think it's probably gone up since then. And then we asked them about a number of different possible features relating to sexual health. And you can see here, this the pink bars, um, you may or may not be able to read every last one here, but what you can see is that the pink bars are essentially, yes, we want the apps to add the, this feature. And the gray bars are, no, we don't really want that on our app. So what you can see is very strong support kind of across the board. Um, and, and there were only a few interventions that, um, or you know, features that app users weren't particularly interested in. And just to, to name some of the top ones here, alerts about disease outbreaks in your, your area, being able to order a free home HIV test, which I'll be talking about a little bit more in just a moment, um, being able to keep information about your partners um, on the app, being able to order free condoms. These are some of the examples that were very, very strongly supported by users. So I'm gonna talk about, um, these are some of the major initiative initiatives of building healthy online communities. I will not have time to talk about all of them, um, but I am gonna try to talk about uh, these first two, hopefully three. Um, so the first is kind of how we work with apps on their new features and really give input um, and consultation to the apps around what kind of information is prompted for um, by, a, by the users um, in terms of being able to coordinate um, and, and share information with potential partners. The second is um, a home testing project that Building Healthy Online Communities launched two years ago. And the third is our anti-stigma effort called Nice AF. Um, we did also create this other um, um, project here called Tell Your Partner, um, which I will not have time to, um, to delve into today, but is, it was a very interesting project um, that nonetheless I think is very important. So right, what you can see here is um, a, an example of one of the projects that we worked on. So we partnered with Grindr quite a lot. And here you can see what the options are for disclosing sexual health preference, um, HIV status, uh, and sort of prevention practices. So here you can see this person has indicated that they're negative and they're on PrEP when they were last tested. And right away, they're also able to click into this information with the sexual health FAQ. So we have consulted with Grindr with a number of other apps on these different features. And I, I wanna be clear that we are very strong advocates for sharing this kind of information and the option to share it. We certainly recognize that this is something that folks can opt out of or to choose not to share, um, but we think it's very important and we think it helps create a norm around being able to share that information, being able to prompt users to have further discussion about it. And in some cases, really even awareness about PrEP. Um, and so I think, you know, this is, this is a, a definitely a key part of our work um, and something that we continue, continue to do with many of the different apps that we're working with. So here you can see just kind of a quick summary of where some of these different um, apps and sites are in terms of some of these key features. Um, we've worked with nearly, we've worked with all of these apps um, in some cases, like a very strong, very close relationship and in, in other cases, not as much. Um, part of what I was um, starting to say also is that, you know, app users themselves, of course, have been a huge part of this. So, you know, we gather information about what app users want, but also app users just start to use the apps in the way that they want to. So they may have no real place to put their sexual health preference, but if there's an open field, they'll start typing that in. And I think the app owners, you know, take note of that. So we can take note of that, but we can also see, and the app owners start to see, oh, okay, this is something that folks who are on the apps really want to use. So um, another example that I referenced is the Sexual Health Information Center. So again, here's an example from Grindr. This is actually um, relatively older data, but at that point, um, there had already been 16 million users who had accessed information on Grindr's Sexual Health Resource Center. We've worked very closely with them. We've written a lot of the content. Um, and again, I think this is just indicating like this is where the people we're trying to reach are. And so we have this huge opportunity if we can build these relationships and strong partnerships with the apps, it really helps um, 
enable to get the word out. Um, we know a lot of younger folks, this is where they're going for their sexual health information. We would love if they could also get it from other places, from schools, from doctors, from, from other trusted resources, but we know that they are able to get it here. And so we're gonna continue to advocate for you know, accurate information, for comprehensive information and resources. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about this project that I referenced, Take Me Home. Um, we did a, this is a, a project that we've done in partnership with both NASDAD um, and Emory. And essentially this came from the early work where we were gathering information and continue to gather information from users about what are some of the key features that they want. So you saw that one of the top ones was being able to order a home test, a home HIV test. So what recognizing that we did some additional um, formative research to ask about, um, uh, you know, kind of how, how many users on these apps have, have recently tested for HIV, what we saw was huge opportunity because quite a high percentage, 22% um, reported that they'd never tested for HIV. And then, you know, even more of course hadn't tested recently. So there's a huge opportunity to use the apps to, to let folks know and to direct them to home testing. Um, and so what we did was create, um, create a home testing platform um, here you can see the data I was just referencing. There was a strong support from users. And, and also I will say very strong support from app owners as well. I think they this you know, testing is something that's very tangible um, and easy. And I think they recognize the importance of it. So our model works like this. We have um, public health partners like health departments, for example, who sign up and they we're working again in partnership with NASDAQ who's managing a lot of the contractual piece of it. They, they purchase kits, we put them into their, their sort of stock in um, their inventory on our portal. The dating app partners that we've worked with extensively advertise this service and that is largely in kind because of the relationships that we've built over time. The user gets to order the test at no cost, which is very important, right? Because over the counter, these tests are, you know, 45, 50 bucks and it's, it's expensive and it's not really accessible. Um, and then we have a lab and fulfillment partner who ships the kits directly to the users. This is what it looks like just so you can see, of course, you know, the vast, vast majority, probably well over 90% of the users are accessing the, this, um, you know, through their phones because they're on their phone on Grindr or one of the other dating apps. They get a message and they can click right through they can order a test in less than a minute. So we've tried to make it as simple as possible, as seamless, um, as discreet. Um, you know, these are some of the things that we heard from users that were important to them. Um, just very, very quick highlights here. In just under two years, we've mailed out 12,000 kits. We've also actually done, um, last year we did a national demonstration project to scale it up and in that eight month period gave out 100,000 kits. So this is something that definitely scales <laughs> very well. Um, but in terms of our sort of ongoing program, we, we started with four health jurisdictions and we currently have 24. Um, some of those are states, some are counties or cities. Um, what I'm most excited about is that a third of the users report they've never tested. So we're effectively reaching a group that was not otherwise accessing healthcare or you know, these kinds of health services. Um, and that's been really exciting for us. I think that was why we started this was to reach the folks who weren't otherwise engaged. So we're really excited about that. And we've worked with some of our um, health department partners to try to do surveillance matches. That part's a bit more complicated, <laughs> um, but, but we're working on that in terms of uh, better being able to answer around positivity. Um, so let me jump in for my last few minutes here to talk a little bit more about stigma. And this connects to some of the work that we've gotten to partner with um, Dr. Pachenkis on. So a number of years ago, I think it was in 2018, 2019, um, we got to work on a project together in which we um, were able to ask a, um, a subset of dating app users about a number of different interventions that might help reduce negative experiences. So you can see here, there are four examples that we were asking about at that point, um, looking at a, a code of ethics that, that requires users to kind of sign on before as, as they're joining the app, um, being able to flag if there's a negative experience and then direct folks to, to like information, right? Educational video, um, being able to re reward users who are respectful and polite, 
Um, and then also having pre-generated messages that, um, that makes it easier for a user to say that they're not interested in someone in, in a respectful way. So th this is a way, 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 way oversimplification of this project. But I think what I see here is that you're, we're on a one to five scale. You're seeing overall generally support and positive um, you know, interest in all of these. When we got into the specifics of it, there were some reasons that one was preferred over others in different situations. But bottom line is I think most of these are, you could, you could do all of them, right? Um, and this <clears throat> led to another campaign that BHOC took on. So um, over the last couple of years, we started a project called Nice AF in which we engaged the apps to support and be a part of um, coming up with some of these solutions. So in this case, you know, one year we had um, a contest for users to be able to kind of share their experiences of how they, um, how they navigate these situations and they could sort of upload a video and then there was like a, a way to be able to vote on it. And the way the apps participated was they helped recruit and let, the, let um, their users know that, that they could participate and that this was happening. This past year, what we did was actually a bit more complicated and had quite a number of steps. Um, we engaged the apps again to promote, but what we did was ask app users to participate in um, a series of different um, inputs. So they gave, um, they engaged in a survey with some very simple questions. Like in this scenario, what would you want the app to do to support you, right? And from that, we gathered 20 different anti-stigma features that the apps could have. Um, we had nine, nine um, apps that participated. And then we had the users participate again and say, okay, of these different ones, which ones do you want like the most? And again, we shared this back with the apps. So you can see um, just some of the themes that came up. Um, of course, across the board, it was making sure that they're gathering input, the apps are gathering input from folks who might be most marginalized. Um, that that's a really important piece throughout for any feature that they release that they really need to think about how it might affect different populations differently. But other themes were being able to give users more opportunity for customization, being able to expand filtering and filtering functionality, increasing clear communication and supporting emotional and physical safety. And here you can see kind of a lot, these can be coded in a lot of different ways. There's, you can see that the they're not mutually exclusive categories, but many of them did fall into the area of safety. So being able to have unlimited blocks, for example, that a user could say, you know what, I'm not putting up with any more of this. I wanna be able to block someone and not have a, a paywall around that. Um, being able to report kind of why are you reporting someone? Not just I'm reporting you, but I'm reporting you for this reason. Um, and then different, these issues were around safety, but also communication, being able to mute a conversation rather than block someone in some cases might be a more nuanced way of handling that um, or being able to hide a user. Um, I'm gonna start to wrap up here. And I just wanna, I guess we're moving into questions, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to, um, I, I wanna let you all know that if you're interested in this topic, we have a, a very long detailed report as well as an executive summary on our website, niceaf.org. So you can certainly get more information there because I definitely had to go you know, quickly through this um, project, which was a, quite a, a complex and nuanced project. Um, but let me stop my share. Thank you uh, for that time. And thank you for um, for that excellent presentation and sharing all of the um, amazing work you've been doing with building healthy online communities. Um, so I'll um, open it up to questions from the audience for Jen. Feel free to use the raise hand feature or just speak up. I'm seeing a raised hand from Kristen. Um, thank you, uh, Jen, for such an informative presentation on um, a topic that is of great interest to me. So I am an HIV prep provider. Um, I was in New Haven and now I'm in the deep south. And I'm very interested whether the apps can help link users 
to us as PrEP providers? Can someone in Augusta, Georgia, where I am, find me uh, through these apps? Because I'm hearing repeatedly that people don't know where to go. They're going mm -hmm. to their primary care providers, et cetera. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and there's I could probably answer that in many different ways. Um, and we could probably have a much longer conversation about it. But um, I'll say a couple things. One is that, you know, for the most part, the apps operate globally. And at the very least, most of what we're doing with them in regards to resources or interventions are really focused kind of nationally. So one way we manage that is to make sure we include the national directories, right? So the CDC, um, NPIN, you know, they have these national directories where you can put in your zip code and through that zip code, you find clinics that are available near you. And so that's sort of like one link that we can give to the apps that the apps can post and then anyone can use that. And so that's kind of the simplest way because otherwise there, it, it becomes very overwhelming. Um, so we're definitely, we definitely think about that a lot. Um, in regards to, um, I will also say that, you know, when we direct people to testing, testing directories, we direct people to home testing, in our platform, we're very much thinking about PrEP and thinking about linkage to PrEP. Um, so for all the, um, the participating health jurisdictions, we have local health resources, we encourage them to put PrEP information. Um, so that, So there's definitely, many different ways for that to happen, but I very much appreciate the question and um, I will continue to think about other, other, other ways that that can be as efficient as possible. Well, um, thank you for that answer. Just one, one thought that came to, my, came to my mind as you were talking, which is mm -hmm. if you have the opportunity on these apps to put in your own information, personal information, could you put in a, a suggestion? Could, could, could one person sort of say, um, I refer you to Dr. So-and-so um, who, who is a local prep provider, um, because word of mouth would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's, um, that might be too much for what the apps can, can, would choose to take on. Um, that said, some of the apps have very comprehensive sexual health information centers and are working toward thinking about some of what you're saying, which is like, if I say I'm looking for this, you know, to, to kind of be able to tailor some of that information that they get. Um, but again, I, I'm, I'm writing down what you're saying and um, thank you so much for that suggestion. Thank you. Alexander, you have your hand up. Yes, um, <clears throat> I remember in 2004, the Guardian Health Association did a multimedia campaign on manhunt and scruff and things have changed tremendously since 2004. They have. But we noticed then that um, people letting their guards down, um, people weren't taking their meds or using condoms. 33% of people with syphilis were also HIV positive. So we did a campaign and we had tremendous ad placements. Like a lot of people saw the ads, which linked them to a resource locator from the CDC, but very few click throughs. You know, not many mm -hmm. people actually clicked on it. Any comments on what would give people incentive to actually click that for yes. help? Thank you for sharing that experience and that um, that's a great question. So um, a couple different things. For one, I think that the apps can be effective ways. You can have, have good, good click throughs there, but what in general, what we've noticed is that the apps are really good for awareness. So you're gonna a lot of you're gonna get a lot of eyeballs. People are gonna become aware of what you're doing, and in some cases, in many cases, we suggest that for those kinds of campaigns, using multiple different platforms. And when I say that, I might mean several different types of dating apps, but also Google, TikTok, um, you know, Instagram. I'm just you know naming a few, and that often it's a mix of those, right? So like maybe you you sit, you laid eyes on it on Scruff, but then you also saw it in your, um, you know, on Google and you were able to click on, on it there. So um, I think that's an important piece. I think we're, we're definitely still learning a lot about what can be most effective. That's actually another project that I work on is um, gathering folks together to, um, you know, who are doing these kinds of ad buys and, and, 
essentially try, trying to pull out the best practices, like what are we all learning that we can share with each other so we don't each have to learn these lessons individually. Um, but, but that's a great point and a great question. And I think we're getting better, but we definitely still have a lot more to learn. Um, and then there's, there's also, just to say one or two more things about it, you can also um, have various different kinds of tracking mechanisms that help you learn, oh, okay, I saw more clicks here, so I can actually move some of my, um, my money from, from this platform to that platform because this one's working the best for this particular project. So great question. Thank you, Alexander. We have time for one more question, um, Abby. Thank you. Um, Jen, thank you for this great talk. Um, so I am also trying to use social media uh, for a study I'm working on, um, but it's it doesn't have to do with um, intervention. Um, can you expand more on how you developed relationships with these apps and um, develop that strong collaboration? Yeah, absolutely. And I I jokingly say that, um, you know, in research, we talk about like hard to reach populations, which in reality aren't just aren't necessarily hard to reach. We just don't necessarily aren't necessarily a part of them. I will say that in my experience, the app owners are the hardest to reach population I've ever worked with. Um, and and I want to be clear that that one of the things that building healthy online communities does is is to as you can see, we're a consortium and we have all these different public health partners. We really try to help address the bottleneck. So by that, what I mean is rather than have dozens of researchers or dozens of public health departments trying to reach out to the apps to ask for something, we try to help um, navigate some of those relationships in a positive way because it's just not realistic for them to talk to each and every researcher, to engage in relationships with each and every health department. And quite honestly, sometimes the health departments are asking for um, they're not coordinated. So they're asking, their requests of the, of the apps are sometimes in um, not synced up. So you have like a health department, you know, a local health department that's also that's trying to do something at the same time as the state health department is doing it. And, and those are sometimes getting in the way of each other. Um, and, the, and the apps themselves, not only do they not necessarily have time for all of those conversations, they don't know how to prioritize. They're not public health folks and they've repeatedly said this to us. And so they turn to us to say, hey, we just got you know, 17 different requests, which one should we do? And then we provide some guidance there. So um, I would be happy to follow up with you, Abby, but I, my, it's not my first suggestion to then to go to develop those relationships with the apps for that reason. Um, but, I, but again, I'm happy to follow up with you and, and share more about that. Okay. Th uh, thank you so much, really appreciate it. I'm appreciating these great questions. Thank you, Jen, for, um, for, for your presentation and for your um, generosity in answering the questions. Um, for the sake of time, we'll move on um, to our next presenter. Um, we'll also have time um, at the end of that presentation and then at the end of all the presentations um, for further, um, for further Q&A. Um, so our next presentation is by Dr. Catherine McCapigal. Um, take it away, Dr. McCapigal. Thanks, John. Let me see here. Can you see my notes page or do you see um, the presentation? We can see your notes page. Okay. There's nothing in the notes page. So let me, uh, is that better? That's perfect. Okay, great. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, excited to talk about this topic that um, I think about all the time, um, about how adolescents use these online spaces. Um, and its role in socializing teens to HIV risk and prevention. And I think uh, Jen's presentation set this up really nicely uh, and I'm excited to talk uh, more a little bit later. So um, scientific research on the use of online sexual spaces, which I might refer to as online sexual spaces or SNAs or sexual networking apps is predominantly focused on adults. Um, but we know um, that teenagers, uh, and when I say teens, I predominantly mean uh, under the age of 18, but could be including 13 to 19 year olds, that it's really normal um, and developmentally normal for teens to explore and experiment with things that are technically off limits. 
Um, and uh, from other research that I've done, we know that uh, gay, and queer teens have really low rates of PrEP use, um, in part stemming from limited awareness, access, stigma, and other structural barriers. And I'll talk about how these things kind of like dovetail a little bit later. Um, I first became interested in um, teenagers and their use of apps um, probably around 2016 when our team at Northwestern was developing uh, an online sex ed and HIV prevention intervention for adolescent sexual minority males. And in some of these brainstorming conversations about what content should be in this intervention, we were talking about Grindr and whether teens were using it. And I mean, 2016 in internet years is a million years ago. So <laughs> thinking about whether teens use Grindr these days is like, yeah, of course they do. But in 2016, we we're like, oh, actually, I don't know. So I, I did a, a Google search and found um, this post on Ask Gay Bros about this mom whose son um, she thought was using Grindr and kind of posted it and was like, what should I do? And um, one of the responses uh, struck me, uh, which I highlighted at the bottom, saying that if your son is gay, you need to give him a different kind of sex education. And um, from this kind of spurred my line of research on adolescents' use of um, online sexual spaces designed for adults, their experiences around it, and how they might learn about themselves and about sexual health and risk um, from those spaces. So um, the kind of guiding research questions that, that I've had over the last few years and that kind of frame the overarching stuff I'll be sharing with you um, are what are gay buying for teen boys' experiences with sexual networking apps? So I'll give you a high level overview of that. And what role do they play um, in their socialization to HIV risk and prevention, including PrEP? Um, so uh, what do we know? So this is just a very like one, one page overview of, of several years of work. So we know that they use them. Um, but how many really varies. So I've done a number of, my colleagues and I have done a number of um, online uh, research studies that have um, been in the context of RCTs or um, cross-sectional surveys um, with adolescent sexual minority males aged 13 to 19 um, and have asked this question, you know, have you ever used um, an app like Grindr to meet partners? And just depending on the study um, and depending on the sample, it really varies. Um, we've uh, seen as little as 39%, um, ranging all the way up to 70%. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe the truth is somewhere in between. Um, and we've also done some work knowing that without sex education that acknowledges teens use these applications, um, many teens kind of develop this like do-it-yourself approach to figuring out their safety online. Um, um, which my uh, former grad student Kyle Josa sort of took the lead on. And we also know that sexual networking applications offer this very easily accessible but kind of imperfect way for adolescents to learn about their sexual identity, what they're interested in, and HIV prevention. So another high level overview here, um, what we found is that, uh, that the teens that we've talked to tend to first use these applications in middle adolescence. Um, as you can see here in this graph, uh, roughly 15 years old plus or minus a year, which is pretty, um, you know, I think in terms of thinking about uh, sexual identity development and sexual initiation is pretty consistent with that kind of phase of adolescence. And um, most teenagers reported using Grindr um, and, uh, and they also reported using or, or seeking partners elsewhere online. It's actually pretty common for people to use um, Grindr as well as say like Snapchat or, or some other sort of social media platform to look for partners. And when I say app use, um, I think that the first thing that people often think of is um, that all teens are meeting people online and having sex with them, but that's actually not the case. When we ask them what they actually do, it involves kind of a range of behaviors from just lurking and seeing what, what other people are doing and seeing who else is queer around you um, to actively engaging with other partners um, and then making plans to have sex with them. 
And of those teens who we have uh, surveyed or interviewed, um, who have met partners offline, online or offline explicitly for sexual encounters, they report um, lower risk sexual activities. Uh, those tend to be more common. So things that are like happen exclusively online. Um, and if they're happening in person, most commonly things like hand jobs, blow jobs, et cetera. Um, so one thing to also mention is, is that one thing we found is that teens often very briefly use and then discontinue apps. There's not, um, um, unlike, you know, adults who might have them on their phones, kind of, you know, to chat with friends and then hook up with people and stuff like that. Um, the teens in our studies uh, will often use them and then find that it's not working out for them for some, for whatever reason. Um, and unsurprisingly, a lot of the reasons to start using apps were to find dates and serious partners, to have sex, but um, the kind of less, less commonly endorsed reasons, but like there were a whole bunch of them were all these things that centered around loneliness, feeling isolated, wanting to know that they weren't alone, things like that. Um, and the most common reasons to stop um, were that teens were receiving overly sexual messages they felt very uncomfortable with, um, as well as getting into a relationship and just kind of feeling like they weren't finding enough people nearby. And we heard a lot of things like this, like it's gross because almost everyone there is only for sex or nudes and not legit relationships. Um, it's weird because it's just a bunch of older men trying to get with me. We heard the word creepy a lot. We heard the word older a lot and, and a lot of the uh, adolescents we talked to, um, you know, just stopped using these apps because they just, they, they went on the apps looking for one thing and then finding that that wasn't where they could find it. So, um, you know, kind of getting to the like main thrust of this talk is that these spaces can socialize teens to both well-being and prevention as well as risk. And um, in online focus groups and interviews and, and surveys, we've had teens tell us things like this, um, that these spaces allow for them to learn about their sexuality, identity, and sex in a way that um, is more private and anonymous. So this uh, teen says, I met a bunch of guys there who explained to me what sex was like and the terms that are used within the LGBT community. Um, we also find that some teens, not many, um, initi initially learned about PrEP through their use of sexual networking applications. And again, they sort of vary depending on the sample. Um, and you can imagine that things like banner ads, um, you know, like the fact that, that PrEP and things like HAV testing are kind of baked in profile features um, are ways that teens can sort of passively learn about, um, about sexual health. And I think that sexual networking apps can play a role in normalizing HIV testing, um, prep use and disclosure of those things. Um, we have seen that teens who've reported using these apps uh, report higher rates of testing than those who don't and also are more likely to report prep use um, with people they meet online than with people they meet offline. Um, you know, again, these are from sort of cross-sectional studies, so we can't say that uh, app use caused testing or like caused prep use or anything like that, but um, I think that future research can kind of see whether there's some sort of association in there. Um, in another study of ours, we found that most teens had positive perceptions of folks who disclosed um, prep use online, um, as well as positive perceptions of their own self-disclosure of prep use. Um, and some adolescents actually thought that that might help them find um, find a partner um, because they might they might seem more appealing or safe or what have you. And on the flip side, we think, or I think, that online sexual spaces can um, socialize teens to risk. So. Um, we, in, in some of our qualitative work, we found that teens uh, can express this very like healthy skepticism about status disclosure um, and prep use online. Uh, like this one teen said here, I think STIs can always be lied about. Um, uh, but in other work, we've seen that a lot of other teens assume status. Like, well, I assumed, you know, I assumed he was negative because he was hot and somebody who is that hot can't, you know, can't have an STI or HIV, or um, I, they're negative because they told me and sort of not kind of going beyond that and, um, you know, getting tested with a partner and things like that. 
Hello. There we go. Um, teens who ever used sexual networking apps uh, reported higher perceived HIV risk than those who hadn't. Um, again, sort of can't tell whether being on the app caused that or whether they sort of knew going in that, you know, they, uh, they kind of had, you know, like had engaged in more works behaviors and that's why they were using, um, you know, the apps. Um, and uh, an important point that I think that I want to underscore that, that Jen said in, in their presentation is that use of these applications is really unlikely to cause people to have um, condomless sex or engage in other risk behaviors, but sort of the prevailing idea uh, in the scientific literature is that these spaces might attract people who might engage in more risk behavior more so than, you know, kind of meeting folks offline. So how should we mitigate these risks while preserving uh, benefits for adolescents? So I think that the, the kind of premise behind my whole body of research is that we can't wait for queer and inclusive sexual health information to make it into traditional school-based sex ed. That would take forever. Um, and I think that information about sexual health and well-being should meet teens where they are and they are online and they are in you know, these online sexual spaces. And one thing that is really cool that building healthy online communities is doing is trying to make sexual health information accessible to users, which can then benefit teens who technically aren't supposed to be there, but it's there anyway. Um, and we as researchers, public health professionals can design resources and tools for teenagers to learn how to navigate these safely if they choose to do so. So I wanted to show you um, an example of something that we've done in our group um, uh, as part of uh, an online HIV prevention program for gay, boy, and queer teen boys. So um, we developed a tool called Humper based on this research that I have done um, on adolescents' use of sexual networking apps. And part of the reason why we did that is because we wanted to acknowledge that like teens are doing this, or if they haven't started doing it, they will. And um, you know, we, we have an opportunity in this program to sort of get ahead um, of, of all of these concerns that teens have, have told me in my own work uh, and educate them about, you know, what to look for um, in these applications, how to evaluate, you know, is this person, like, what is this person saying on their profile? What kinds of questions might you wanna ask this person if you decide to chat with them and that sort of thing. So, um, in this app, participants um, have the opportunity to um, develop their own profile. Um, as you can see here, this person is kind of clicking through the different options, um, and each option has information about what that means. Um, and then as soon as they're done doing that, they have um, profiles that they can click on. And kind of the purpose of this activity in the context of the intervention is to look at um, um, to sort of teach teens how to evaluate, uh, you know, potential risks and uh, potential risks online. So again, here you can see this person hovering over the different fields um, and, uh, you know, like learning what it means when somebody says that they're bottom verse or what their um, HIV status is unsure means, what, what friends with benefits means or FWB. Later on, you'll see um, somebody uh, that they click on um, that reports um, like P and P. What does that mean? What is NSA? What is BB? All that stuff um, to give people a sense for you know here are some things that you might be encountering um, on apps like these, and here's how what this may be related to in terms of your risk. Um, so I'm going to start wrapping up here. Um, so what can adolescent health providers do? So if you work with teenagers, I think there are a lot of, um, um, a lot of things <laughs> that the adolescent health providers can do differently or better. Um, first, it's important to ask. Um, ask where they're meeting their partners, um, you know, whether if they're meeting partners online where um, and sort of understand the context um, that especially queer teens are not necessarily just meeting um, partners in person. Um, and then assuming that they are using these applications, um, this clinical perspective article that some colleagues of mine and I wrote uh, a year or two ago outlines a few things that we think folks should do, like reducing shame, providing developmentally appropriate spaces for identity exploration, 
talking to them about legal considerations, especially since they're on an application they're technically not supposed to be on because of their age. Um, and because of that, they may be likely to meet partners who are older than they are and what to do in situations like that. Um, providing counsel on sexual health and HIV prevention. Um, and then uh, I think that clinicians and researchers could do a better job advocating for, for youth, um, um, for safeguards online and kind of working with app developers and things like that to, um, you know, kind of do better by teens. Um, so to wrap up, uh, online partner seeking, I think, is really related to this very developmentally normal need um, for connecting with other people, exploring your sexuality um, among LGBTQ teens. Um, I'm not saying that teens should necessarily be on these apps. I'm not saying that um, this is a place that like, I would encourage teens to go necessarily, but they're there. And I think that's a reality we need to acknowledge. Um, and it has pros and cons for sexual health and well-being. And I think time and again, I've heard from um, like the hundreds of teens who have participated in these studies that, you know, they're there because it is a space they can go, not because they necessarily want to be there all the time. Um, but, you know, a potential benefit of them being on these spaces that could promote um, and normalize use and um, use of HIV testing and PrEP. Um, it can offer them um, a way to explore their sex and sexual uh, behavior, interests, identity, et cetera, in a way that is, um, you know, may feel safer for them. But um, without kind of formal educational resources in these spaces that have been vetted and we know to be accurate, um, they might learn things that aren't quite right um, and might, uh, you know, actually lead to more risk for them. Um, and again, without sort of educational um, interventions, um, you know, teens might find themselves in sexual situations or just unprepared um, to navigate. And if they don't feel comfortable talking about it to people, you know, that just that kind of stigma and stuff just might kind of perpetuate um, these problems in teens. So um, in short, I think that addressing teens, uh, HIV prevention, sexual well-being is, is super necessary in online sexual spaces. And I'm, um, I'm uh, excited to hear from other folks about how we can make this a reality. So thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much for sharing your excellent research and um, and everything you've done in this area. Um, well, we have time for, for one or two questions. Feel free to raise your hand or just speak up. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Dave Matthews here in New York City, uh, researcher at the CUNY uh, School of Medicine. Um, uh, Catherine, thank you for that really, really great presentation. Um, I loved, needless to say, I love the tool. I, I've done a lot of work uh, delivering interventions and programs in uh, community-based organizations, and we tried our best to work with um, apps uh, from an HIV prevention effort perspective. And I love the tool, and I'm curious as to when or how through the study the uh, participants were exposed to the tool, um, but, and then more so, what were some of the HIV prevention um, aspects that came up in association with the tool that could potentially help reduce risk, you know, going forward. Could you re so so could you restate that? And from what I heard, it sounds like you want to hear a little bit more about the program and like its outcomes. Right, but in, but in particularly the app tool uh, that you showed, the Humper, right? That I thought was fantastic, but I, you know, and it's right, it's a. It's a, um, a simulation of an app through which if the participants, you know, the research participants choose buttons, right, they get this information. Um, how was it understood that that could help reduce risk of, you know, transmission risk and or was there information, additional information associated with the tool to, 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 to you know, that, the, uh, that would expose the teens uh, to risk, that would help reduce risk? Yeah, um, yeah, great question. So this um, amazing tool is is one of probably um, a billion tools in a very large package of uh, online sex ed and HIV prevention um, programs for teens that we developed. It's actually part of 
a stepped care series of three different kind of increasingly intensive interventions. So this particular one um, was part of a uh, part of a program called um, Smart Squad, which for adults, we call it Keep It Up. It's kind of a different program. Um, but uh, essentially, it kind of puts teens, it, it, it delivers education in sort of a contextual way, like instead of saying like, here's HIV, this is these are your risks for it and stuff like that. It puts people in real life situations that they might be navigating and tells them a little bit about like, here's the situation, like here's what you might find yourself in, here are the things that you might consider when being in this situation. Um, and then some of the activities in this, this uh, program kind of ask teens to reflect, you know, on the activity or um, there's like a kind of queer teen web series soap opera that we developed with it um, that follows several teens and like their romantic and sex lives and things like that. And we have teens kind of reflect what would you have done in that situation? What could these what could these characters have done differently? What might you do if you were in that situation? So um, so we collect some data on. So this trial actually this is part of an, a large RCT that is wrapping up, I believe, or we've I think that's I think that we probably recently wrapped up data collection. So we haven't quite looked at the outcomes of the whole trial specifically, but I'm really curious to see because after each section um, in the intervention we ask people for feedback on what they liked and what they didn't like and how, you know, like what was useful. So one thing I'd really love to do next is to kind of dive into that data specifically about like what people clicked on, what was useful to them, because we also have click level data, user data, that sort of thing. So I feel like I kind of went off somewhere. Was, no, was there like no, another that, question in there? Okay. You, you, that was really good. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks for the great question. It looks like uh, there's another question from, from Kristen. Um, so uh, LGBTQ youth here in the South are extraordinarily vulnerable physically and um, psychologically. And I wonder if you can just speak to the safety of online apps as youth may come out share personal information, um, do, do they know the sort of the limitations of privacy and safety as they may disclose uh, personal information? That's a really great question. And I would say two things that seem maybe counter to each other. One, it depends on the teen, <laughs> to, uh, but, and then the second thing I will say is that teenagers are extraordinarily savvy at navigating the internet, um, way better than adults are. Um, so, and, and, and in our qualitative work with adolescents, um, we've seen, and, and in their kind of descriptions of how they navigate safety online, um, some of them have outlined very like sort of airtight, like detailed strategies about how they protect their own safety, how they have trusted friends to that they loop in when they're meeting partners, how they triangulate information from potential partners they're meeting online to make sure this person is who they say they are and that sort of thing. And then there's a group of teens who's just like, I don't really think about it. So, you know, and I think that that kind of speaks to like the developmental, like, like adolescence is this, I mean, a 13 year old is really different from a 17 year old. Um, and a 13 year old and a 17 year old could have the same maturity level. It's a little hard to say. So, I mean, I think that um, the, 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 there's no, to my knowledge, there's not some really great like online dating safety curriculum for teenagers. Um, we often tell teenagers to not be online. Um, so I think that the fact that we just don't talk about it makes it unsafe. They're, they're there to figure it out on their own. Um, and they do, a lot of them do a great job figuring it out on their own, but some of them don't. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's definitely a concern among adolescents that they're going to get catfished by people who, um, you know, uh, aren't who they say they are or, or have sort of, you know, nefarious intent. And that's definitely a concern. And I think, you know, kind of speaking to some of the comments here about what's going on uh, in the South that, you know, 
would definitely be a concern of mine. So I don't have a great answer um, for that, but I think that, um, and, and when I published some of this research earlier, like several years ago, um, you know, I, Grindr had no comment, you know, yeah. like we're not aware of teens using our, our spaces, which, you know, I think for probably legal reasons they have to do, but, um, but they're there and we need to do something about it. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what, what that is quite yet. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions and for the, the great uh, presentation, Dr. McAppigal. Um, we can save any other questions um, for the final uh, Q&A at the end. For the sake of time, we'll move on to our, um, to our third presentation um, by Daniel, Claude, and Ian. Uh, Daniel, do you want to get it started? Yep, thanks, John. Let me see if I can share the right screen. How did I do? You did great. Okay, great. Um, great. So uh, one of the three of us introduce ourselves and then I'll, I'll go into an uh, overview of Chat for Change. So I'm Daniel. Um, I work at, with Sierra at Yale and I was the, um, the Yale lead on this, on this collaborative project. Uh, I'm Claude. Um, I am now a facilitator, but was uh, before a participant in the first phase of uh, Chat for Change. Hello, I'm Ian Jackson. Like Claude, I was also a participant in uh, phase one of the project and now a facilitator as well. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. So let me give everyone an overview of what Chapter Change is and was. So um, Chapter Change has been this collaborative endeavor um, funded by the Connecticut Health Department through a CDC funding mechanism. The lead on the project is APNH, a place to nourish your health um, in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and Sierra at Yale uh, led the program development. And then Share Solutions is the um, evaluation consultant on the project. So this is a pilot project to promote PrEP uptake among 18 to 34 year old Black and Latinx MSM in Connecticut by having peers engage them on apps like Grindr and Jacked. Uh, we've heard a lot about these apps already. There's a, a little uh, example of the kinds of conversations that happen on these apps. So this was a demonstration project, a CDC HIV prevention demonstration project. This wasn't research, so that will impact um, some of the ways that we talk about the information today. Um, it was, however, theory informed. We, uh, I'll talk quite a bit about the community involvement in trying to develop what the program looked like. Um, but ultimately, it, it, it started and continued to be an iterative and flexible approach to engaging um, uh, guys on these apps that really um, was left up to the individual participants kind of style and approach. I'll give you a moment to read this quote. So this was from one of our work group participants, and I'll say a little more about what the work group was. Um, we had a discussion where we asked about how participants learned about PrEP. And I think this, this uh, anecdote highlights the potential and the potency of the kinds of messaging um, that, that someone can get from a peer in a sexual space like Grindr. So if I could take you back to the year 2017, top song on the radio was Salt and Peppa's Let's Talk About Sex. No, that can't be right. Um, but 2017, we, I, I was working at the Connecticut Department of Health and the HIV Prevention Program. Um, this is giving you a sense of the number of PrEP users um, from AIDS View uh, over, the, over the years from when PrEP was introduced until 2019. And, and we see that at the time, um, PrEP use was increasing, but um, I guess about 40% over the previous year in 2017, but, um, but we know that it was mainly among um, white MSM. So this is actually more recent data and it's uh, showing us the, the percentage of PrEP eligible people according to CDC definitions who actually got prescribed PrEP in 2020. And although this is all um, people in the US, not MSM, we know that most PrEP uptake has been among MSM. And we see that whereas two thirds of, of white 
individuals who'd be eligible for PrEP have access PrEP, um, less than 10% of um, Black individuals in the US have, and about 16% of Latinx individuals. So this was clearly a, uh, an issue. Um, PrEP was exciting and had the potential to reduce new infections, but also to exacerbate um, disparities. So we were uh, trying an, a number of things uh, in the state. Um, the graphic here is kind of a simplified PrEP uh, cascade, much like the HIV care cascade. And we were, we were really trying it at all levels um, and also at all sort of uh, social and structural levels. Th there was uh, some policies we were pursuing. We had just started um, in 2016 to fund um, PrEP navigators at a few sites around the state. Um, but what we were hearing from PrEP navigators, uh, so these were staff at CBOs and health centers who were able to provide health navigation support and, and helping people access PrEP, um, was that the people they talked to who would have you know, been good candidates for PrEP were not, were not that excited about PrEP. Um, they were concerned about side effects, they had distrust of the medical system, and there was even a sense that uh, PrEP was a conspiracy. So we knew that we needed to do more, um, uh, that it was super important to support people structurally and being able to access PrEP, make it easier, cheaper, um, but, uh, but, but the awareness and willingness, this first stage in this kind of simple cascade was, was clearly an issue. So we proposed to, uh, to try to address this problem over um, apps that we've been talking about today. We had some local data which told us that um, the majority of, of people newly diagnosed with HIV in Connecticut reported meeting sexual partners online. Um, and from, from national data that um, MSM who were using these dating apps were using them a lot. Um, and uh, that there was also some openness to HIV prevention information on those apps, despite them really being spaces typically used for socializing and sex. So th that was, uh, I would say, you know, part of the, the theory behind the work. Um, I'll go over this motivational prep continuum a little bit. And um, you know, we had some other theoretical constructs that were helpful in thinking about specific ways that peers might influence um, one another. So this uh, motivational prep cascade, similar to the other cascade, but focuses a little more on the idea of prep as a behavior change, not just a, a set of logistical steps. Um, so the premise with the project was that we would uh, help to move people um, along this behavior change continuum. And when they got to the phase where they were interested in actually accessing PrEP, um, there was the you know, traditional, not the right word, because it was, it was a new intervention, but, but we would be able to link them to a PrEP navigator for this more standard PrEP support. But that these on these early stages where someone wasn't, um, didn't, didn't feel like PrEP was a match for them, they maybe weren't thinking about it at all, they thought PrEP was for people totally unlike them, um, that, that talk, talking to people like them about PrEP or seeing um, people like them, uh, you know, talking about having used PrEP in their profiles, um, we thought that that could be helpful. Um, so the, the, the first thing we actually did was some stakeholder engagement. We did focus groups with HIV prevention staff. Um, and we had planned to do focus groups with, uh, with people from the focus population ended up deciding to spend a little more time and be a little more active than focus groups. So we did uh, also, when, when the funding finally happened, I took you to 2017, but by the time the funding came around to APNH through the health, through CDC to the health department, um, we were in 2020. And um, we had we had to shift right before we started doing everything virtually. Um, we re recruited a group that we called our work group, uh, met over Zoom, and we used, you can see a screen cap here uh, from this virtual platform, Miro, where we were able to um, uh, put up um, prompts and activities and get responses and record all of that in this virtual uh, space. So we did this work group with 13 people from around Connecticut, um, a little more heavily black than Latinx. They all were in our age range. Um, they uh, mostly identified as male, two uh, identified as transgender male, mostly gay. 
um, and most had used PrEP or um, at some point or were currently on PrEP. But just another example of the kinds of activities we did um, to better understand their use of social media and dating apps. We, we also, in this example, talked through approaches to learning about PrEP on dating apps. So we were contrasting um, talking to CBO staff, which even at, in 2017, um, you know, maybe a lot of you said your agencies were doing work um, in the app. So you may have been on the apps. The screen cap was, was um, an, a real example of, a, of someone who called themselves a prep navigator um, and was trying to talk to people in the app. So we contrasted that with what if, um, what if one of your peers just mentioned prep in their profile? Uh, where might that conversation go and what, what were the potentials there? Um, we talked about what qualities uh, would make for a good peer for the project and the group uh, made suggestions and they actually helped us decide to call the peers in the project prep ambassadors. So we then recruited an overlapping group. So some people stayed on, Claude and Ian were, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure we're in both phases. Um, so they've been with the project for a long time. Um, some people didn't stay on for various reasons. So we recruited some new people. Um, we had nine uh, prep ambassadors or PAs as we called them when we kicked off in uh, April last year. And by the time we had a little gathering to have pizza and actually see people in person, um, we had uh, still had seven people working with us. So they were uh, the guys that we recruited uh, already told us they used the apps. Most of the recruitment was done through the apps to find them. Um, we did some training around prep and prep access. We talked about stage to change and some basics around uh, motivational interviewing, like asking open-ended questions. Um, and this is an example. Uh, so we did some activities to try to role play um, who are the kinds of guys that you might uh, encounter on the app. So we did these uh, group exercises where we created personas of um, characters to try to make, you know, make it a little more real. Who, who might we be talking to and what strategies might we use to make connections with them and start to have uh, conversations. So as I said, you know, this was not research, so it was not a really highly structured intervention, um, but we did have some basic criteria that we, that we encourage guys to, to use as they um, talk to people on the app. So we, sa we said, try to be open about your personal prep use, whether in your profile text or in conversation. See if you can find more natural opportunities. So no need to message everyone who's near you and say, hey, can I talk to you about prep? Um, talk to, you know, and don't talk to everyone. I mean, we had, a, you know, we had a number of different guys doing uh, as PAs and um, there was no need to, to sort of bombard people with messages. We asked them to ask open-ended questions, try to build rapport. If they could identify that individual's potential motivations to prep and reflect those back. Another MI uh, informed strategy. And then we also had, um, resources that would help the PAs, but that they could also, if they wanted, um, provide links to people who they talked to. Um, so we had this resource guide, which was um, you know, mobile formatted and um, the PAs could access that. We, um, we don't have, you know, we don't have transcripts or records of anyone's conversations, all that we had to keep track. Um, we met weekly. So we had, we actually had the group report back on um, things that were going on for them. We also had this web-based portal. There were 113 chats that got logged, chats for change that got logged during the course of the um, April to August, I think I said it was. Um, so of those 113 chats, it was pretty evenly split between uh, the guys they talked to being Black or Latinx. Uh, uh, somewhat skewed older within our age bracket. So most were 29 to 34. Most chats occurred on Grindr. Jacked was the second most popular. Um, actually, I'm gonna stop the slides there and um, turn it over to Claude and then Ian. Um, so they, as I said, were, were worked in both phases and they can tell you a little bit about their experiences um, engaging people and, and some other takeaways. Thank you. So, um... I'll first just talk about what motivated me to be a part of the project, uh, which is 
Uh, I saw it as an opportunity to engage with the career community and address stigma and mis in misinformation as someone who has experienced it firsthand. Uh, in the past, I was in a serodiscordant relationship, meaning my partner was HIV positive and I was negative. And I experienced stigma from within the community uh, as well as medical misinformation. At the time, my doctor had advised against me getting on PrEP and told me condoms were sufficient. So this was a great opportunity to change that experience for others. Um, and most importantly, to, to build community. Um, what I appreciated most about the project was how thorough we were trained on the topic of PrEP enough to confidently disseminate that information um, to people that we were engaging with. Um, I got to use the apps in a very different way. Um, Daniel had mentioned before, most of the time uh, people would reach out to me to make conversation. Uh, whereas in the past, if I was using, you know, the apps for different purposes, I maybe would have ignored people that I wasn't really interested in speaking to. Um, but I was a lot more open minded um, and having the skills of using motivational interview, uh, interviewing and figuring out their stages of change when bringing up prep made sustaining those conversations a little bit easier. But obviously, none of the conversations were really linear as far as when prep was brought up. Um, either way, I think the best part was being able to speak and interact with people in a very genuine, curious way and trying to connect. Um, some of the things that we weren't really trained on uh, was figuring out what our boundaries were on the apps uh, when having these conversations. Um, I had the most success on Jacked, but across all of the apps, Grindr, Jacked, and Scruff, they're all very sex positive and very sex forward apps. I've deleted them uh, off my phone in the past if I felt like it was being objectified maybe too much. Um, so with this project being on the apps for uh, hours a day and sustaining multiple conversations across all the platforms, it felt a little bit like the job. And there was definitely an internal pressure to have results and connect people to prep. Uh, and it led to a little bit of burnout. Um, towards the end of the project, the PAs collectively decided to go more in the direction of the quality of the conversation versus the quantity. Um, and it made it a lot easier to end conversations that made me uncomfortable um, or conversations that I couldn't slow down. And it definitely emphasized that community building aspect of the project. Um, I've made a lot of great friends, uh, including Ian in this project, uh, a lot of folks that I still keep in contact uh, with today. So um, that was definitely a positive aspect of it. Um, for future implications, obviously we're uh, all working on version two of Chat for Change, which is more social media based. Um, but what I would have loved to have seen is uh, uh, continuing the community education aspect of it. We obviously it was a demonstration project and getting people connected was the purpose, but I would love to be able to recruit you know, the next cohort of uh, Chat for Changers, educating them on prep, having them go out and talk to people, engage with the community on prep, and then you know, recruit more people and bring those folks in and kind of continuing that cycle uh, that way. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Ian. Yeah, so thanks, Claude. And I think you mentioned a lot of great things. One of my favorite things about this project was that we were able to make community and make connections with people who, I think, as we said, or as someone said earlier, the hard to reach communities, but it's, a lot of the times it's the communities you're not in. So using that peer to peer aspect of using black and Latinx men to reach out to the people in their community, to have the conversations that they're already having was the, one of the strongest parts for me. And the fact that this is a place where people are already talking about sex, they're already trying to initiate sex. So it's just a natural thing for them to say, okay, well, are you on prep? Do you know about prep? What are, those conversations were already happening. So it was great that they were able to initiate those conversations with us and we can give some education or talk to them about prep. And if we decided to do what gay men do on these apps, we could do that, or we can just not and just still have that conversation and take it there. Um, so one of the things for me, I like I said, I love that aspect of it and getting to do those things that don't normally get to happen on those apps. But as far as connecting people to prep, I thought that was the, the largest challenge really there. Um, we encountered lots of stigma around PrEP and PrEP use and medical distrust, especially you can understand why in the Black and Latinx community uh, right now. But the peer-to-peer -peer aspect, I think, made it generally easier to have those conversations because they were reaching out to us. So it's someone that they already felt a connection to, where sometimes you, um, you get reached out to by an organization or a larger um, 
company like that and they say, oh, we're here. This is just like a blank profile for this organization. But to have a person, a person that you connect to, a person that you see, I think allows for a better connection, especially when they want to have a conversation with you. Um, yeah, it, I think it stopped us from getting blocked a lot more often than we did, because sometimes that did happen uh, when we brought up things or pushed a little too hard and questioning, oh, okay, well, tell me more. Like, what do you like to do if you don't like to use prep? Do you like to use condoms? And then people would just cut the conversation. But I think for me personally, I got a lot further in those conversations when I had been talking to the person for a little bit longer or I had a connection with them. And sometimes the conversation skewed away from prep and then we could talk about other things. So it wasn't always a conversation killer or like the conversion to getting someone on prep. Like Claude said, uh, for us as PAs, we felt like we had to really get those people on the site, get the people talking to uh, the folks at APNH to get them on prep or get them tested and things like that. And that put a lot of pressure on us when it wasn't happening. But like Claude said, we had, we had to flip our thinking. And to go back to the story that Daniel uh, gave in the beginning, it's not about the first interaction always that the person has with prep. It can be just planting a seed. It can be having that conversation and then someone else mentions it later. And then they hear about it somewhere else. And then they hear about it somewhere else, but then they have enough seeds that eventually it blooms into something greater and they can come back to you as someone who maybe initiated the conversation around prep, or they may think, oh, this person was really knowledgeable. Let me go back to them and ask them, or maybe they know someone, or if they are on prep, they can connect me to the people that got them the prep. So I thought um, that was a great aspect of the project. Great. Let me wrap up with our slides. So these are some of the takeaways that Ian and Claude mostly mentioned. Um, we, we think that, you know, there seemed like there was that potential through these more naturalistic conversations that, that it's clearly a, a promising space um, to try to, to engage uh, guys around prep. Um, but, but it was challenging for a lot, a lot of the reasons that Claude and Ian outlined. Um, I think we, going forward, we would have loved to have more time to explore the use of these MI-based strategies and, and, and a way to, to be a little more structured around seeing you know, what, what landed and what didn't. Um, and uh, you know, we, as we, we knew before we started, right, that it, it, takes, it, takes a, it can take a long time for someone to, to be ready for prep. Um, and that's, that clearly was what happened. Um, so there were a lot of, a lot of people that had a hand in the project and, um, big thanks to our work group members who spent a lot of time with us on zoom and our, our focus group participants, we had a cab. I mean, there was, a, there were a lot of people, uh, that have been, that have kind of touched this project in various ways. So, um, I think we'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you, all three of you. So we've had a, a presentation on working with the apps, on studying the apps, and now working on the apps uh, to, to, to reach members of the game bisexual men's community and to affect change. Um, what, what questions do we have for, the, for this last team or for, for any of the presenters? Alexander. Sure, what a bunch of great presentations. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing that seemed to be missing for me was the um, reverse direction from Catherine's presentation. I find myself going online being approached by youth quite a lot. So often I'm curious, what's the psychology behind that? Sometimes I'll ask, the answer will be is they can't relate to their peers. And I was recently disturbed by being chased by a very young bug chaser. I've always put my HIV status in my profile long before it was even an option. So uh, I haven't heard about that reverse effect, youth approaching older men and what that's all about and looking at the psychological characteristics and to address those issues. Uh, 
Yeah, I can quickly say that um, the handful of teens that have talked about sort of older partners or older acquaintances on apps um, sort of in a positive way um, like that are sort of more looking for mentorship or like, you know, sort of ways to like navigate um, uh um you know being a like gay or queer teen um and you know there's certainly some um you know i've certainly heard of some teens like you know looking for financial support and things like that as well um, um although i haven't studied that by, like personally i think that's something that i've heard anecdotally is something um that also occurs Natalie. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, all the presenters, for your um, presentation and sharing your work with us this afternoon. My question is for the last um, set of presenters, um, Ian, Claude, and I'm forgetting the last name, sorry. Um, sorry, the thing just shifted, so I missed the last name. But um, I wanted to know, with the conversations you were having, um, you're talking about burnout and, and speaking about um, your interactions with uh, participants. Um, did the, the did any conversations, and I may have missed this, um, occur around just other sexually transmitted infections? And what um, you know did that look like? Um, I know we're you know very focused on PrEP, but you know, I'm in Western New York and we are seeing increases in other um, sexually transmitted infections. So I'm just wondering what did that look like? Yeah, I can speak on that. So um, this is actually something that we had brought up in some of the work groups too, uh, in some of the conversations that I had had a lot of folks um, kind of, well, it had to do with the stigma of going with condomless sex with or without prep anyway. Um, people were stigmatized as, you know, being loose or anything like that. Um, a guy had, excuse the expletive, had called me, said that prep was for sluts. Um, and so I tried to make it more like knowing your status is important, but if this is something that you enjoy, if you enjoy having condom with sex, then yeah, prep is the way to go, but that shouldn't mean that it's your only form of defense. You should still be going and getting tested for other STIs. Um, I think because this project was solely focused on prep, uh, we didn't really have room, at least in the workshops, to really talk about addressing other st STIs. And so coming, like when those came up in conversations, uh, at least personally for me, I would just have to organically just say, well, yeah, you should still get tested. You should still know what your status is for all STIs, not just um, HIV. Similar to Claude, when I experiences the when I experience those type of things coming up in conversations with people saying like, "Oh, well, you can still get anything else," and I say, "Well, yes, but if this is the type of sex that people are going to be having, you should also just get tested, and that's what people have to regulate you when they're on prep." So it's kind of like it goes hand in hand, and then people will be like, oh, "Okay, well." Thank you. Across the presentations, we've seen um, kind of working with apps, which are you know inherently profit driven and and in some cases designed to be addictive, but can still be used like in the last um, presentation to um, to reach the community. It seems though still related to the second presentation that um that maybe we haven't quite figured out how to reach the community of young people, including young people who. Who um, who probably shouldn't you know who, who can't be on the apps by virtue of the law or by the the apps code of conduct it, it, it is it, from across the presenters is your sense that um, that the the public health researchers interested in young gay and bisexual men's health should continue to work with and on the apps to reach this youngest subgroup or should we work to build you know, in-person off app support, including, you know, mentorship and kind of intergenerational transmission of, of, of knowledge and wisdom and empowerment. I'm, I'm curious across all of you all what, what, you, what you think about that. I 
I would love to see apps that are specifically designed for teens, but teens don't have money like adults do. <laughs> and so the profit, you know, is, is not quite there. Um, there have been apps developed for teens kind of, you know, with this idea in mind that they don't have spaces to meet other, other people their own age, but, um, you know, they've kind of been shut down because there's just like a lack of funding. So I mean, I'd like to see things kind of go more in that direction. Um, I, I don't know if there's the appetite for, you know, grinder or scruff or whatever to, <laughs> to make it more teen inclusive. Thanks for that response. Any other questions? We're, we're right at 5.30. Um, I believe we have one more, one poll to close us out uh, that Daniel was going to share. Yep, I can go ahead and share it. So oh, thanks. as we finish up today, just curious, you know, which of the following would help you do more effective engagement on dating and hookup apps? Got some responses trickling in. Give it another couple seconds. All right. So, in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and share this with you. And so, it seems like you know, research findings on effective strategies, as well as further input from groups doing this engagement work, like the excellent presentations today would be helpful. And so I just wanted to briefly say thank you for so much for attending um, and to share our contact information um, for both uh, Daniel and myself. If you'd like to follow up about this, we can also share some potential funding mechanisms with you if you'd like to pursue this work further. And we really appreciate you being here today. And thanks to all of our speakers uh, for an excellent presentation. I hope you have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine.